Praise the Lord. Your voice looks cold. I said, Praise the Lord. I welcome you to our Bible study today. I pray the Lord will bless you and reveal His mind to you and the grace to be obedient to the word. The Lord grant you, grant me, grant us together. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let's pray together now. Father, we thank you today. We we'll bless your name for the Bible study. Thank you for the joy of being at the table with you. And then you teaching us by your spirit. We're asking, Lord, that the joy of learning and the power to be obedient, you grant to every one of us today in Jesus' name. We pray that the teaching, your word, will not be lost on any of us, but it will penetrate our hearts. It will influence our lives. It will transform us completely and will walk in the narrow path that leads to glory, that leads to heaven in Jesus' name. We pray, Lord, that all the grace we need, all the strength we need, all the power we need to walk and to stand firm in your truth, in your word, you grant to us in Jesus' name. Bless everyone in the study without exception. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Today we're coming to the second study. And today we're looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 10, all through to 25. Let's start by reading verse 10. It says in verse 10, Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together, in the same mind and in the same judgment. That's the leading verse we're looking at. And that verse explains everything and goes on to tell us the purpose and the priority of scriptural truth in his church. Understand, Paul the Apostle was writing to the church, writing to the church at Corinth, and by extension, is writing to all the churches. It's writing to the church universal, it's writing to the church local, it's writing to the church national, it's writing to the church we belong to, writing to the church we belong to. And it tells us about the priority of unity in his church. You want to underline that little word, his, his church. Many times there are people that make the mistake, and it's a serious mistake, as to say it's their church. They say, my church, this is what we are going to do in my church. This is the direction we are going to go in my church. This is the plan we are making in my church. What a great, great mistake. It's even a transgression. It's like if somebody came to your house, I mean your literal house where you live, you built it and you have all the documents and you have the title deed and then it says, I want to stay here now for some weeks in my house. You look at him, you say, what do you mean? This is your own house. And the Lord Jesus Christ tells us the same. This is his church and he wants scriptural unity perpetual unity, profitable unity, and scriptural unity in his church. And that is the priority. Paul the Apostle was writing to the Corinthians and he's writing to the whole church. He's saying, whatever you do, whatever you think, whatever you plan, whatever progress you are making, here is one thing that must be at the front, at the forefront of all your decisions and of all your understanding. This is at the very first front, forefront of all your aspirations, the priority of scriptural unity in his church. 
We're looking at uh, these verses and we're dividing the study today to three parts. Number one, the price of commitment to unity in Christ. There's a price to pay. If somebody just says, you know, I'm a member of the church, I'm a minister in the church, and he doesn't understand that unity in the church demands a price. And he wants us to pay that price. For the love of Christ, we pay the price. And for the progress of the church, we pay the price. And for the fulfillment of why we are in the church, a member or a minister, a servant, a saint, for the, to fulfill the purpose, we pay the price of commitment to unity in Christ. Number two is the prevention of contention and disunity in the church. Prevention of contention and disunity in the church. Disunity scatters, disunity destroys, and disunity or contention will scatter and destroy every good thing we have done. Both what you have done, what I have done, what we have all done together, contention and disunity will scatter that and destroy that. It was having that tendency and that direction for the people of God at Corinth. And so we need to look at what causes contention, what causes disunion, what causes disunity, what causes discord, and do everything we can do to prevent contention and disunity in the church of the living God. Point number three, the preaching of the cross and the uniqueness of Christ. The preaching of the cross, that's why the church is there. We're to preach the gospel and we're to teach the people of God. We're to evangelize the world by the preaching of the cross. We're to edify and lift up the church by the preaching of the cross. And so when we've got the unity settled and we've taken care and we've gotten rid of all division and all contention, the very, the very thing, you know, why we're there and why Christ has put us there is the preaching. The preaching of the cross, the preaching of the gospel, the preaching of the message of salvation, the preaching of the grace of God as given to us on the cross of Calvary. The preaching of the cross and the uniqueness of Christ. Let's come to point number one now. Point number one is the price of commitment to unity in Christ. Let's read that verse again. Please open your Bible. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10. Now I beseech you, brethren, he's talking to brothers and sisters, he's talking to those who are born again, brethren, I beseech you, I plead with you and implore you. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that's the greatest name, that's the highest name you can think about. He said, what can I use to plead with you and to help you, to encourage you, to be united. It says by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ that ye all, ye all without exception, ye all speak the same thing and that there be no divisions, divisions in the plural, whatever kind of division, personal, uh, you know, preferences and this and that. It says that there be no divisions among you but that ye be perfectly joined together, not loosely joined together, not temporarily joined together. It says that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. As we look at that verse, and you remember, we're looking at the verse so that we can tell and so that we can dig deep into the price we ought to pay. For the unity we ought to have in Christ. Three things we're looking at. Number one, the purposeful unity of messengers on the scriptures. Number two, the prevailing unity among members through sanctification. And number three, there is the perfect unity of mind for his sake. Number one, the purposeful unity of messengers on the scriptures. That verse 10 again. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all, without exception, ministers and members, that ye all speak the same thing, 
and that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. We're told in Ephesians chapter 4, Ephesians chapter 4, looking at verse 3, it tells us that we need to endeavor and we need to pay a price. We need to make an effort. You know, there are people that just go through life and they see they are Christians, they do not make a deliberate effort to be in unity. They do not make a deliberate effort to pay any price. But the Lord is telling us, he says, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. We're endeavoring and we're striving and we're trying everything we can as much as it lies in our hand, as much as it is with us, we pay the price. We say, I'll give up that so we can be united. I'll not go that direction so we can be united. I will not uh, rob this other way, uh, contrary to what uh, my friends, my, my brothers and sisters, what they expect. I want to endeavor by all means, in all ways, to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. That's what the Lord has called us to. He tells us in verse 4, He says in verse 4, because there is one body, and one spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling. It says everything should be one. That means united. There is the oneness of the body. There is the unity of the body. There is the togetherness of the body. There is the coordination and cooperation of the body. It's talking about the church. In the church, like the human body, having hands and feet and nose and ears and eyes and lungs and everything, and everything is working in cooperation and coordination one with the other. If they walk contrary to the other, there's disunity, and then there is, you know, distraction, they go astray. But we keep the body one, and then there's one spirit, one Holy Spirit, and that same Holy Spirit is in the mind, in the heart, in the spirit of all the believers. If there is one body and one spirit dwells in all of us, even as we are called in one hope of your calling. We're going to the same place and we have the same hope, the same hope of getting to heaven. It's telling us that there is a world to be united. And that's the reason we ought to have the purposeful unity among the members, among the ministers, among the messengers of God on the scriptures. Our unity is based on the scriptures. It tells us in verse 5, in verse 5 it says, we have one Lord, one controller, one redeemer, and we have one faith, and we have one baptism. It says in verse 6, then, because of that one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all, it tells us in all those verses, the reason why we must be united, and the power and the basis and the pivot of our unity. It tells us in Philippians chapter 1, verse 27, Philippians chapter 1, reading from verse 27, only let your conversation, only let your character, only let your manner of life be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you, or else I be absent, I may hear of your fears. Look at this, that he stand fast in one spirit. It's not in superficial unity from the spirit, from the heart, from the mind. It says that we stand fast in one spirit and with one mind. Look at that, with one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel. There's only up, there's one uppermost desire one uppermost purpose and what um, uppermost pursuit in our heart it is for the progress of the faith of the gospel and so we stand fast together it tells us in a second uh, timothy chapter 3 verse 16 on which on what is our unity to be based it's on scriptures all scripture is given by inspiration of god 
and is profitable for doctrine. That's the basis of our unity and reproof. That's what we are united on. And for correction, that's what we are united on. And for instruction in righteousness. Look at verse 17. In verse 17, so that the man of God may be perfect. That's why we're united. When all the ministers of God are united, when all the messengers of the world, when they're united, it is so that every child of God in the church, every, every believer in the church, everyone in the church may become perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Well then, if that is the purposeful unity of messengers, ministers, members on the scriptures, What's the prevailing, how do we understand then, uh, the next thing here, the prevailing unity among members through sanctification. Prevailing unity among the members, of course, among the ministers too, among everyone, all the people that claims to be members of the church born again, uh, dwelling in Christ, remaining in Christ, abiding in Christ. There's a prevailing unity among members through sanctification. We're coming to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. We're reading from verse 10. It says, Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all, brethren, ye all, members, ye all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, no divisions among you, no disagreements among you. And there's no one who is born again, who is a child of God, indwelt by Christ, indwelt by the Spirit of God, saying, I disagree. You don't disagree with Christ. You don't disagree with your fellow brother, fellow sister. You are based on the scriptures. You are standing on the scriptures. It says there will be no discord. It says there will be no disagreement. It says there will be no, uh, there will be nothing you know, that will sway you off the real stand and the pivot and the support of the word of God. There will be no divisions among you, that, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Revealing unity among members through sanctification. You are wondering, you know, how can two people be together and they never disagree? Well, if they're looking at the same direction, if they're going to the same destination, if they're traveling together to the same point, and if they are indwelt by the same Christ, and if they are infilled by the same Spirit, and if they are directed and controlled, guided by the same Scripture, that's how they can be together, whether they are two, or ten, or a hundred, or a thousand, or even millions. Once they're indwelt by the same Christ, they have that same prevailing unity among them because of sanctification. Look at John chapter 17. In John chapter 17, reading from verse 17. John chapter 17, verse 17. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. There are people that tell us that when you are saved, you are also sanctified. What they mean is, when you were saved, you were set apart. But sanctification is deeper than just being set apart. It is God doing a transforming work in our heart. I will give them a new heart. I'll give them one heart. I'll take the stony heart out of them and give them the heart of flesh. Those who say that when we're saved, we're also sanctified. Uh, if you look at the result of sanctification, you don't find that in those lives. Look at verse 21. It tells us the reason why he wants us to be sanctified and why he himself will sanctify us that they all may be one that they all may be one. And there are people that misinterpret that. Let's all come to be one. Let's forget Bible. Let's forget scripture. Let's forget uh, differences. Let's forget doctrine. No, not at all. Jesus was not praying for uh, people to be sanctified so that they can overlook sin, overlook evil, overlook transgression, overlook false doctrine. He wants us to be united, united on scripture. 
united in the spirit and united in the purpose why the church is established by him that they all may be one one in scripture that they all may be one one in doctrine that they all may be one one in purpose and pursuit of life that they all may be one as thou father art in me and I in thee, that they also may be one in us. Can you imagine being one in Christ, one in the Father, one in us, and having divergent views, having divergent interpretations of the Bible, having divergent directions to go, and even being against or opposed to the doctrine of Christ, while we are one in him, impossible. The unity Jesus prayed for and the prevailing unity we ought to have and the prevailing unity sanctification brings is that they also may be one in us that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. In verse 22, it says, and the glory which thou givest me, I have given them. The unity brings the glory of God, the grace of God, the godliness of the gospel. It brings all that into our lives, that the glory which thou givest me, I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one. Underline that here, Bible, even as we are one. What does that we mean? The Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, even as we are one. Can you imagine Christ being different from the Father in doctrine, being different from the Father in teaching, being different from the Father in plan, in purpose, in pursuit? Can you imagine Jesus Christ saying, hey, Father, you belong to your denomination, I belong to my denomination, we are one outwardly, and we are one superficially. The angels cannot observe, the angels cannot tell of that unity, but we're, uni we're united. And it says, you know, provisionally were united not at all real unity and unity that goes deep into everything and that pervades everything that's the unity that real sanctification brings that they may be one even as we are one in verse 23 in verse 23 i in them and thou in me that they may be made perfect in one uh, oneness or unity does not excuse imperfection Let's be united, overlook imperfection. Let's be united, overlook transgression. Let's be united, over overlook worldliness. Let's be united, overlook holiness. Not at all. It says, I in them and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. That's a purposeful unity. There's a prevailing unity. When I come to this perfect unity of mind for his sake, perfect unity of mind for his sake. We're looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 1, reading from verse 10. It says, Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing. And not when you are in church, that we all speak the same thing. All those who are ministering, were are ministering to the same people, the singers ministering, the scripture teacher is teaching, and uh, all the others that have anything to do, the ushers are ushering, and all the men of God, women of God, who are doing anything, saying anything uh, to the body of Christ, to a local church, that all of us speak the same thing, uh, that one will assist the other, one will complement the other and everything we speak and everything we minister will go in the same direction that she all speak the same thing that's in church when we get back home in our houses all the various houses where the believers are we don't say anything brother so and so must not hear sister so and so must not hear this one you know i don't like this i don't like that but we all speak the same thing whether we're in church 
or we're at home, anywhere we find ourselves, we're talking to believers and we're talking to anybody about anyone in the church of the living God that we all speak the same thing, we're witnessing, we all speak the same thing, we're preaching, we all say, say, say the same thing, uh, and anywhere we are, it says that ye all, at all times, in all places, in all situations, that ye all speak the same thing, uh, that there be no divisions among you. That's how we know those who are truly born again. That's how we know those who are real children of God, who are not living superficial lives, and who are not living hypocritical lives. I'm saying something, he's saying something, others must not hear, members of the church must not hear, and they spring in division at the back, in the back, and they stabbing other people at the back. Those ones are not born again, those ones are not children of God. All the children of God, the brethren, they speak the same thing, that there be no divisions among you. There be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together, not loosely joined together, not superficially joined together, not only in tongue joined together, not only when we see one another face to face joined together, but perfectly you are glued together. Perfectly you are joined together. The joining together brings perfection. The coming together brings perfection, and the journey together helps us to perfect the saints, to perfect the church, and to perfect everything concerning every individual. That's what it means to be perfectly joined together and in the same mind and in the same judgment. And look at this in First Corinthians chapter two, verse sixteen. In First Corinthians chapter two, verse sixteen, look at what it tells us here. It says, "For who has known the mind of the Lord, that He may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Not that we're going to have; we have the mind of Christ. You are born again. You are sanctified. You are purified." The damnic nature is dealt with, the depravity is taken away, and the root of sin has been uprooted from there, and the Lord gives you a new heart, a new mind, then we have the same mind. Understand, let's say for example, for illustration, uh, for the sake of illustration, uh, your brain is exactly as my brain. Your thoughts are exactly as my thoughts, and your passion exactly as my passion. Your pursuit exactly as my pursuit. We're going to decide the same thing. We're going to plan the same thing. We're going to see the same way. We're going to go the same direction. Understand then when it says we, not only I, not only the apostle Paul, but the evangelist and the prophet and the, and the, and the apostle and the pastor and the teacher, they all have the same mind, the mind of Christ, the ministers, the messengers, the singers, the workers, we all have the same mind and then all the members of the church eating from the same table eating dwelling on the same word indwelt by the same spirit of god everyone having the mind of christ there's going to be perfect unity but we have the mind of christ that's the mind we ought to have and it is that kind of mind with which we speak and with which we act and with which we live our lives in romans chapter 12 reading from verse 2 romans chapter 12 we're looking at verse 2 it says and be not conformed to this world be not conformed to this world. You know, that, that's what brings a disunity. If one person is conformed to the world, another person is trying to be conformed to heaven. It, when those two people are together, one is looking the direction of the world, the other one is looking the direction of heaven. There's going to be disagreement. They won't understand each other. But be not conformed to the world, but be ye transformed. By, renew, by the renewing of your mind, mind renewed, of every member, mind renewed, and the old mind is taken away, 
the old thoughts are taken away and the old direction, the old way of thinking taken away and be, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. It tells us in um, Philippians chapter 2, Philippians chapter 2, we're looking at verse 5. In Philippians chapter 2, reading from verse 5, it says, Let this might be in you. Already it's available. And then the Lord is saying, This is the mind you ought to have, your brother, your sister, your minister, your member, and you are a member of the body of Christ, a citizen of the kingdom of God. Here is the might we ought to have when people, when the people of God come together and we're all going this direction, and he has the mind of God, I have the mind of God, she has the mind of God, we have the mind of God, and then one solitary, isolated person says, I have another mind. I'm not thinking like that. What mind do you have? If five people are together and four people have the same mind, the mind of Christ built based on the scriptures, indwelt by the Spirit of God, and then one isolated person says, I know that's the Bible. I know that's what everybody thinks. I know that prayerfully we are prayed and this is the direction to go, but I have the same mind. Brother, that's not right. Let the might of Christ be in you. Let this might be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And look at verse 6. In verse 6, it says, Who so being in the form of God, thought it not trouble to be equal with God. It's not, you know, the Lord Jesus, the Son of God, was not competing with God. I'm also God. I'll prove it. I need to be independent, and I need to be of my own mind. I can't be doing everything the Father has ordained every time. He said, no, the Father walketh, and I walk. What the Father has sent me to do, that is what I'm doing. He suspended the attribute of divinity, who being in the form of God, thought it not trouble to be equal with God. When you have the mind of God, when you have the mind of Christ, when you have the same disposition that Jesus Christ had, you suspend whatever you seek of yourself, that like Jesus Christ in the form of God, and yet he thought it no trouble to be equal with God. Look at verse 7. But he made himself of no reputation, and he took upon him the form of a servant. That, that's the secret. You take upon you the form of a servant. I take upon me the form of a servant, and we come to serve uh, the people of God, and to, we come to serve humanity, and we come to serve God like Jesus Christ, and then we divest ourselves, and we, we empty ourselves of who we are, and make of ourselves no reputation. We're not looking for reputation, for honor, for, re for recognition. He made himself of no reputation, but he took upon him uh, the form of his servant and be found be made in the likeness of men in verse 8 it tells us that he submitted himself be found in fashion as a man he humbled himself and became obedient unto death even the death of the cross that's the expectation that you will have that i will have that we will all have the mind of Christ. And with that mind of Christ, we have a purposeful unity. We have a prevailing unity. We have a perfect unity. Let's come to point number two now. We're looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and we're reading from verse 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, we're looking at it from verse 11. In verse 11, it says, For it has been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which of the house of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. Paul the Apostle was not at Corinth at this time. He had spent uh, some time uh, at Corinth when the work was at the foundational level. He had preached the gospel unto them. He had brought many of them uh, into the grace of God. As God told him, Paul, 
be of good cheer, fear not, because I have many people, much people in this place. He abode there. He stayed there. And he brought them into the kingdom by the preaching of the gospel. After that, he left, and other people now ministered there. Apollos ministered there, and then they had known about Peter called Savers. Now, they were taking sides. It's like, I prefer this, I prefer that, that the disunity that came in their midst. And then Paul, the apostle, said, It's been declared unto me of you, my brethren. He says, my brethren, as for me, I'm united with you. And whatever you say, you're Paul, you're of Apollos, you're of Christ, you're of that, I am still counting myself as your leader. And you are my brethren. He says, it has been declared unto me of you, my brethren, that by them which are of the house of Chloe. You see, uh, the house of Chloe household of Chloe, and that is the family of Chloe. They were believers and they were members of that same church. And they were the people that wrote to Paul the Apostle and said, Paul, Apostle, Apostle Paul, there's disunity here, and people are saying this, and people are saying that, but you understand, the house of Chloe did not write an anonymous letter. Those are cowards. I don't want them to know that I was the one that said this. And then Paul, if you are going to correct this in the church, don't mention our name, don't mention our house, and don't mention it's the house of Chloe, because then they'll be looking at us. They wanted to stand for the truth. And because they wanted to stand for the truth, there was no secrecy at all. It's been declared unto me of you, my brethren. By them which are the house of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. And we're looking at something here, the prevention of contention and disunity in the church. His church. Always remember that this is the church of God. This is the church of Christ. This is the church he paid the price of his own blood to redeem and to bring together and to call out of the world the prevention of contention and disunity in the church. Three things we're looking at. Number one, preventable uh, contention and disunity in the church. You know, it's preventable. It's preventable. You stop anything that will bring disunity. I stop anything that will bring disunity. We all stop everything that will bring disunity. A little change there, a little correction there, a little yieldedness there, a little submission there is preventable. We can prevent contentions and we can prevent disunity. Preventable contentions and disunity in the church. Number two, prioritized concentration on discipleship in the commission. When you have a priority that this is what Christ has demanded and this is my beach in that demand and this is my portion in that commission and you're looking at the priority and the important thing that you are called to do. I'm looking at the important thing, the priority of what I'm called to do when you prioritize your concentration and your consecration on discipleship, on what the Lord has demanded in the commission, there will be unity and then perpetual consecration to the doctrine of the cross. Number one, preventable contentions and disunity in the church. We're coming to 1 Corinthians chapter 1 from verse 11. For it has been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are of the house of Chloe, that there are contentions, not that there were, not there might be, there actually are contentions among you. And Paul the Apostle did not sweep that under the carpet. Don't talk about it. By time, time will get rid of it. Time will solve the problem. Don't address any issue. Just overlook it. He said, no. Here is the leading of the Spirit of God. I am told there are contentions among you. In verse 12, it says in verse 12, Now this I say, that every one of you says, 
I am of Paul and of Apollos and I of Silvers and I of Christ. You know what they were doing? They were dividing the church into camps. And some camps under Paul, another camp under Apollos, another camp under a savers, another camp said, we don't recognize any man. No man is our leader. No man is our shepherd. No man is going to direct us. We are of Christ. They say that camp is the worst of them all because they can give excuse. They can say, yes, I know what Paul said, but I'm not a Paul. I know what Apollos said. I'm not a Apollos. I know what uh, Silvers Peter said, but that's, that's not my concern. I am of Christ. And they would hide all their actions, everything they were doing uh, under the Christ they did not really believe, the Christ they did not really obey, the Christ they could not see. That was the reason for the contention among them. It says in verse 13, in verse 13 it says, Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? And or were ye baptized in the name of Paul? You see, this was a kind of contention that was preventable. They didn't have to do all this. They, they had received the gospel and they had been saved. They were born again. And they didn't have to go into different, different camps. But you know what brought the contention among them? Look at Proverbs chapter 13, verse 10. Proverbs chapter 13, reading from verse 10, it tells us only by pride commerce contention that's a lack of submission only by pride comes by contention that's the lack of humility only by pride commerce contention uh, that's saying i'm above paul i'm above whatever paul is saying i'm above apollos who is apollos i'm above that who is Severus? who is that i'm above that they are above every minister and they are above anyone that can teach, that can counsel, that can direct them, anyone that can correct them. They were incorrigible. And it was that pride that brought contention. Only by pride, underline that word only, only when there's, when there's contention in any family, either the husband is proud or the wife is proud or the parents are proud or the in-laws are proud. Pride is hiding somewhere, and it is pride that makes the fire of contention and the fire of disunity to keep on burning, and nobody can put that fire up or put it down when there's pride in the heart. Where Christ should sit, where Christ should occupy, where the word of God should occupy, where the Spirit of God should control. Uh, that individual has driven Christ away from the throne of his heart, has driven the Spirit of God away from his heart, and pride is now sitting there, and pride is saying, don't take that from them, don't accept that from anybody, don't let them know, and don't let anybody feel that you can't be submissive, you can't be humble, raise up your head, raise up your voice, raise up your own idea, is pride that brings contention, but what the well advised is wisdom. The one who has listening ear, that's the one that has wisdom. And then we look at Second Corinthians chapter twelve. Second Corinthians chapter twelve. We're looking at verse twenty. What he could have prevented the pride, the contention. The disunity. Here is what happened among the Corinthians, among the people at Corinth. It says in Second Corinthians chapter twelve, verse twenty-five: Fear, lest when I come, I shall not find you such as I would, and that I shall be found of you such as she would not. Lest there be look at these debates. They have gone back into the world. In the world, they normally debate. And you say, if you're going to be voted, and if you're going to be accepted, and if you're going to be elected as either president or governor or counselor, 
then all of you are competing. There's competition in the world. And they bring them to the public. They say, let's hear you. And they're debating, I will offer this, I will offer that. Another person will come in that debate. I will offer this, I'll offer that. And because of that debate, that's what brought contention. And envies, envying one another, envying the position this one has and the position that other one has. And wrath, unsettled anger, wrath, indignation, and strife. There's infighting or backbitings, whispering, swellings, and tumults. In verse 21, it says in verse 21, unless when I come again, he was coming back to them. My God will humble me among you that I shall bewail many which have sinned already. Sin has also come in during all that debate and during that contention, during that disunity. They were not looking at their personal lives anymore. A lot of things, carelessness, transgression, backsliding came in and nobody was correcting that because all they were looking for is the position of Paul. All they were looking for is the eloquence of Apollos. All they were looking for is the experience of Sivas. All they were looking for is the pride to put themselves on a pedestal to say, I am of Christ. They were not looking at their personal lives and therefore everything was running down. It says, I shall bewail myself of many which have sinned already and have not repented of the uncleanness and the fornication and mischievousness which they have committed. Sin actually brings contention. Backsliding brings contention. Debates bring contention. Strife brings contention. But all that is preventable. If we look at our personal lives and then we approach the word of God in a personal way and we internalize the word of God, whether it's coming from Paul or coming from Apollos or coming from Peter or coming from the gospels that were reaching uh, before Christ uh, left the world, everything we take everything together and we internalize the word of God. And our concern is to be holy and to be righteous our concern is to be at the center of the will of God and to get to heaven there'll be no division there'll be no disunity there'll be no contention and there'll be no disagreement among us all that contention is preventable number two prioritize concentration on discipleship in the commission we're coming back to first corinthians chapter one and we're reading from verse 14. we're looking at first corinthians chapter one verse 14 i thank god that i baptized none of you but crispus and gaius and then in verse 15 it says lest any of you should say that i had baptized in my own name in verse 16 it says in verse 16 and i baptize also the household of stephanas besides i know not whether i baptized any other verse 17 in verse 17 for christ sent me not to baptize but to preach the gospel for christ sent me not to baptize but to preach the gospel was paul the apostle saying was he saying that water baptism was not important not at all he was saying i have the great commission go and preach the gospel he also said those who believe baptize but you know i have helpers I have supporters while I preach and I bring them into the kingdom. I then transfer the uh, baptism of the people to the local pastor there, to the local preachers there, and I move on from Corinth. I go to another place. I have converts, and then those converts, I hand them over to the pastors there. They are baptized. I move to another place. I'm preaching the gospel. My concentration is the preaching you know, of the gospel. 
others do the baptism. Look at Matthew chapter 28, reading from verse 19. Matthew chapter 28, we're looking at verse 19. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Then in verse 20, it says, in verse 20, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. Amen. Paul the Apostle said, there's water baptism, and then there's discipleship, teaching them all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And when those people were brought into the gospel, he allowed other people to baptize them. He said, how could he do that? Shouldn't he baptize uh, before he left town? Look at John chapter 4. In John chapter 4, we're reading from verse 1. John chapter 4, looking at verse 1, and look at the process and the pattern of the Lord Jesus Christ when therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard. Look at this that John made and baptized more disciples than John. Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John. Verse 2. In verse 2, it says, Though Jesus himself baptized not, but his disciples. Look at that. Jesus brought them to the knowledge of salvation. Jesus called them to repentance. He repented and turned into the kingdom of God. And then Jesus baptized not, but his disciples. Look at verse 3. In verse 3 there it says, He left Judea and departed again into Galilee. That's exactly what Paul the Apostle was doing. That he brought them into the gospel and allowed supporters and all the people that are working with him to baptize those converts in water. Come to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 17. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, we're looking at verse 17. Here is perpetual concentration to the doctrine, consecration to the doctrine of the cross. It says, for Christ sent me not to baptize. My priority is preach the gospel, not with the wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ shall be made of none effect. He said, here is my priority, and here is the pattern of my life, and here is what I do, emphasizing the doctrine of the cross. Look at verse 18. In verse 18, it says, for the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of of God. I bring the people face to face with the power of God, with the preaching of the gospel. It tells us in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. It says, That's my priority. I lift up the minds of the people the eyes of the people, the understanding of the people on the Lord Jesus Christ. Others can handle the water baptism, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. He endured the cross, despising the shame, and he said on the right hand of the throne of God, he said, that is my priority. The death of Christ on the cross and what Jesus did to take away our sin and then to bring us into the kingdom and make us abide in the kingdom. We come now to point number three. Point number three is the preaching of the cross and the uniqueness of Christ. The preaching of the cross and the uniqueness of Christ. We're coming to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, reading from verse 18. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, 
But unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. The preaching of the cross is what leads us to experience the power of God. That's the power that saves. That's the power that transforms. That's the power that converts. That's the power that recreates in us a new nature. That's the power that sanctifies. That's the power that brings us to the blessing and the fullness of all the provision of Calvary. It says that's why I concentrate on that preaching of the cross. Three things we're looking at. Number one, the preaching of the provisions in Christ's cross. The preaching of provisions in Christ's cross. Number two, the prediction of the peril of contradictory contestants. Those who contradict the cross of Christ, contradict the provision of salvation through the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, they contradict all the promises and they contradict everything the Lord had made in his propitiation on the cross, the prediction of the peril of contradictory contestants. Number three, the partakers of the power of Christ's crucified. The partakers of the power of Christ crucified. Number one, First Corinthians chapter one, verse eighteen. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is. That's the preaching of the cross. It is the cross of Christ. It is the power of God. It tells us in Ephesians chapter 2, reading from verse 16. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 16. And that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross have been slain the enmity thereby. He tells us, here is how the Jews are reconciled unto God. Here is how the Gentiles are reconciled unto God. Both the Jew and the Gentile is by the cross of Jesus Christ, by the death on the cross, by the sacrifice of the cross, by the atonement on the cross. He has slain the enmity, enmity between the sinner and God, enmity between the religious Jew and God, enmity between the idolatrous Gentile and God. Christ has slain that enmity by his death on the cross of Calvary. Look at verse 17. It says in verse 17, And he came and preached peace to you, which are afar off, afar of Gentiles, and to them which were nice. Those are the Jews. In verse 18, it says, For through him, Christ who died on the cross, for through him, Christ who made atonement for all our sins, for through him, Christ, a Savior, a Redeemer, that paid the whole price on the cross of Calvary, for through him, we both Jews and Gentiles, men and women, higher and lower, we both, all of us, from what direction, whatever direction we're coming, for through him, we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. Through him, Christ, who died. Through him, Christ, who sacrificed. Through him, Christ, who paid the price on the cross. We have access to the Father by the Spirit of God. In verse 19, in verse 19, Now therefore, ye are no more, to, ye are no more strangers, ye are no more foreigners, but fellow citizens, with the saints and of the household of God. In verse 20, it says, it says, Now, and we are built upon the foundation of the apostles and the foundation of the prophets, Jesus Christ himself 
been the chief cornerstone and then verse 21 in whom all the building fitly framed together grows into an holy temple in the Lord verse 22 it says in whom we also are built together for an habitation of God through the spirit that's what the cross has done that's what the power of the cross has effected in every life of everyone that has believed on Christ who died for us on the cross of Calvary Colossians chapter 2 we're looking at verse 13 in Colossians chapter 2 reading from verse 13 and you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh as he quaking together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. And then in verse 14, it says in verse 14, blotting out the unwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, everything contrary to us, our sin, and the consequence of our sin, and the accusation of the devil, everything contrary to us because of our past transgression, everything like the yoke and the judgment and the condemnation, all those things contrary to us, he took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. He took all our condemnation, nailing that to the cross. He took all our accusation, nailing that to the cross. He took all our judgment, the wrath of God against us. He took that out of the way, nailing it to his cross. And then in verse 15, it says, And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them on the cross. Triumphing over them in it. Let's come to point number two. The prediction of the peril of contradictory contestants. We're looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 1, reading from verse 19. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 19. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise. I will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. You understand? It's talking about those who are wiser than the provision of Calvary. Those who are wiser than the preaching of the cross. Those who count the preaching of the cross foolishness. And they think they are wise. It's talking about worldly wise people. They are wise in the philosophy of the world. They are wise in the intelligence of the world. And they count the wisdom of God, the provision of God, and the preaching of the cross in foolish sin, and they contest against the preaching of the cross. They contest against the salvation that Christ provided on the cross of Calvary. He said, it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the worldly wise. I will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Then in verse 20, in verse 20, it says, where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? And then in verse 21, it tells us, for after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom, the world by philosophy, the world by all their literature, the world by all their politics, the world by all their tradition, the world by all their good works, the, the world by all their natural native religion, knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. In verse 22, it says, For the Jew require a sign, the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But their wisdom has not allowed them to submit to the wisdom of God and the salvation of God. They abandoned the word of God and they were proclaiming themselves to be wise. 
wiser than the scriptures, wiser than God's plan of redemption. Jeremiah chapter 8 verse 9. In Jeremiah chapter 8, reading there from verse 9, here it says, A wise man are ashamed, they are dismayed, and taken low. They have rejected the word of the Lord, and what wisdom is in them? They have rejected the word of the Lord. They have rejected the provision of the Lord. They have rejected the salvation of the Lord. They have rejected the preaching of the cross, and what wisdom is in them? They are condemned because they reject the wisdom of God, they reject the word of God, they reject the provision of God, and they reject the salvation of God, and their wisdom has become foolishness. Let's come back to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18. Now we're looking at the partakers of the power of Christ crucified. The partakers of the power of Christ crucified. First Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, unto us the stewards of the mysteries of the kingdom of God unto us, the servants of God unto us, the believers at Corinth, at Philippi, at Ephesus, and the believers in our church today unto, but unto us, believers everywhere until the end of the age unto us which are saved. Salvation is real. Redemption is real. Transformation that comes as a result of believing the preaching of the cross is real. Unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. In verse 23, it says in verse 23, But we preach Christ crucified. And that's what we believe. Christ crucified. That's what provided for salvation. Christ crucified. That's what provided for redemption. Christ crucified. We preach Christ crucified unto the Jews as stumbling block and unto the Greeks foolishness. In verse 24 it says, But unto them which are called for Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God unto us who are saved, unto us who are called, and we respond to that call, Christ is the power of God and is the wisdom of God. In verse 25 then, it says, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men. There's no foolishness in God, but what the Greeks and the Jews, what they call foolishness, the provision of salvation through the death of Christ, what they call foolishness, all right, the foolishness of God, so to say, is wiser than men. All their wisdom cannot save a soul. All their wisdom cannot bring transformation. All their wisdom cannot bring redemption into any life. But it is the foolishness of God, the preaching of the gospel, when they count foolishness, that is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. It's telling us about, as we believe, about the fact that as we believe in Christ crucified, our sins are taken away. He becomes a substitute. He is a sin bearer. He takes our sins away and we become partakers of his salvation, partakers of his redemption, partakers of everything he offered by his death on the cross of Calvary. Look at chapter 2. In chapter 2 of 1 Corinthians verse 2, it says in verse chapter 2 verse 2, for I determined not to know any sin among you except save Christ Jesus, Jesus Christ, and him crucified. Why? Because that's the source of our salvation. Why? Because that's the one that makes provision for salvation. 
Without the cross, there will be no conversion. Without the crucifixion, there will be no conversion. And therefore, he said, I wanted to know nothing among your Corinthians except Jesus Christ and him crucified. That's the thing that has brought salvation to us now in Romans chapter 1, verse 16. Romans chapter 1, verse 16. It says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. How could anybody be ashamed of the gospel of Christ? Oh, because the Greeks are saying, is that all you have? Is that all you want to say? And they look at that as not, not wise enough, not philosophical enough. He said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. And then the Jews are saying, you're not uh, proclaiming the law of Moses. Is that all you have to say? He said, although they cast aspersions on the preaching of the gospel, yet I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. To the Jew force, he abandons the law of Moses, he abandons the animal sacrifices, and he comes to believe on the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world to the Jew force and also to the Greek. The Greek, he, he forsakes the wisdom of the Gentile, he forsakes the idolatry of the Gentile, he forsakes all the hero worship of the Gentiles, and he believes on the Lord Jesus Christ, and then that faith in Christ becomes the power of God unto salvation unto everyone that believeth and it becomes a new creature in Christ a transformation takes place a change takes place it becomes a new creature in Christ second Corinthians chapter 5 in second Corinthians chapter 5 reading from verse 17 second Corinthians chapter 5 verse 17 therefore if any man be in Christ, any man a Jew be in Christ, any man a Gentile be in Christ, any man a Greek be in Christ, any man an African be in Christ, any man he was religious before he wasn't religious at all, any man when he comes to Christ, therefore, if any man be in Christ, it's a new creature. Salvation comes in. Transformation takes place. Redemption takes place. Reconciliation with God takes place. It's a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Behold, all things have become new. That is the gospel. And that, he wa that is what he wants us to be united on. Let's come back to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, we're reading from verse 10. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, looking at verse 10, Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, because of all that Jesus stands for, because of all the provision of the Lord Jesus Christ, the authority of his name, the atonement in his name, the assurance in his name, the redemption in his name, the provision in his name, everything he has provided for us on the cross of Calvary, I beseech you because of his sacrifice and because of that exalted name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing. There's enough to speak in the gospel. There's enough to proclaim in the gospel. The gospel for everyone, the transforming gospel, the true gospel, the gracious gospel, the glorious gospel, that you all speak that, the same thing, and don't debate, don't debate, but you all speak that same gospel, that there be no divisions among you, no division on doctrine, no, dis no division on discipleship, no division on our dedication to the Lord, no division on our consecration, no division on the path, narrow path we need to get to, no division in the service of God, no division in the church of the living God, that there, be, there be no division of any kind among you, but that she be perfectly joined together, perfectly joined together in this proclamation of the gospel, perfectly joined together in all that Christ has made available perfectly joined together 
in the salvation, in the sanctification, in the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus, in the service of the Lord Jesus, that we are not just loosely, temporarily joined together, we are perfectly joined together in the same mind. You have in the mind of Christ, I have in the mind of Christ, we all have in the, same, the mind of Christ. When we have the mind of Christ, we'll have the message of Christ, we'll have the ministry of Christ, we'll have the motivation, the ministry, and, and the motives of Christ, we'll have the manifestation of the Spirit of God, the same Spirit, the same power, the same goal, the same objective, the same direction. That's what he wants for his church, that we all have that same mind and in the same judgment, in the same decision in the same pursuit, in the same activity, in the same uh, passion, and in the same destination we're pursuing. That's what he's calling us to today and what he calls us to this unity must become a priority. Priority of scriptural unity in his church. Tell the Lord that all that he has revealed to you today, that the Lord will make you internalize, Lord will make you personalize, and the Lord will make you prioritize that we'll forget ourselves and forget every other thing and we know that Christ is number one, Christ is a focus, is the one who has called us, is the one we're looking onto, and is the one we're depending on, and every provision of the cross of Calvary will become yours, will become mine and we'll go on, and we'll move forward, and we'll progress in the calling of God upon our lives. Let's rise up now and talk to the Lord in prayer. Let's rise up, brother, and talk to the Lord. Let's rise up, sister, and talk to the Lord that God will grant us a heart of unity. And then you want to tell the Lord, you want to see that visible unity, demonstrable unity, purposeful unity, perfect unity with the people of God, and that today, after this prayer that you are praying now, a prayer of consecration, a prayer of commitment, a prayer of absolute surrender, a prayer of totally yielding to the Lord, that after this prayer, you will have more unity, more perfect unity, more visible unity with the people of God, with the church of God, with the ministry, and with the ministers, and with the members in your own family too, that you will progress in unity, the unity that Christ has provided through the cross on the cross of Calvary. Tell the Lord that, and examine yourself, any debate in your heart, any division in your heart, any disagreement like a habit, any kind of nature that's always in agreement, have you discovered pride there? It's pride that brings contention. We can prevent that contention. We can prevent that disunity. Is it a tribal sin that is there? Is it that we must have it your way? And we must go your own direction? Isn't that pride? Do you allow pride to sit on the throne of your heart? Why don't you dethrone pride? Let there be no debate. Let there be no discord. Let there be no division. And let there be no uh, nothing uh, that will bring a uh, con contention in the house of God in your heart. Contention begins in the heart. And then at home, are you united with your wife, your husband? Are you united with the family of God? Are you united in the local church? Almost everything go your way. If it doesn't go my way, we'll scatter it. Can you stay behind? Can you step aside? Can you say, no, I'm going to subdue self and then debate, division, disagreement will not evaporate. And I will pursue the unity of the people of God. Prioritize concentration on discipleship. When we have new babies in the family, fathers, mothers, will not be fighting in front of that baby, abandon the baby, neglect the baby, put the baby aside, don't feed the baby, don't nurture the baby. 
were calling me about something, were fighting, were beating each other, each other, and there is domestic violence, and the babies are neglected. The same thing in the church, there's no room for fighting. There's no room for division. There are babies to take care of, there are converts to take care of, there are people to disciple, and we commit ourselves to the discipleship or the discipling of the people in the church. There's the world to evangelize, and there's the church to edify, and there are believers to build up and bring to maturity. There is no chance and there is no room for division, contention, and fighting. Prioritized concentration. Prioritize your concentration, consecration on the work of the Lord. Perpetual consecration on the doctrine to the doctrine of the cross. That's what you should pursue. That's what you should have in your heart, in your life. You have no brain to think of any other thing. The, old, the brain you have, you don't even have enough to develop strategy and to develop all you need to develop in making the church of God go forward. You have nothing about, you know, this and this and that. You want to stand for the preaching of the gospel, for the propagation of the gospel, for the spreading of the gospel. There is no time and there is no chance for contention. Consecrate all you have to the preaching of the gospel prevent contention be a partaker of the power of the crucified Christ and let the Lord himself help you that you will stand for the word of the Lord prevent contention as much as it lies in you prevent contention prevent division prevent pride Prevent anything that will divert you here and there. Focus on the gospel. Prevent anything that will make you concentrate on any other thing apart from the gospel, apart from conversion of sinners, apart from maturing believers. And tell the Lord you'll prioritize, prioritize the concentration you have on the gospel. That will be the priority, the priority of your life. And then there will be perpetual consecration. The consecration you had before, remind yourself of everything. How you work for salvation of souls. How you work for the, dedica for the dedication you have to the kingdom of God and to the work of the Lord. Bring that consecration back again. That it will be perpetual, perpetual what Christ would have done if he were here today. The same zeal, the same fervency, the same power, the same passion, the same pursuit, the same narrow-mindedness on what is essential. You are not so broad that you scatter yourself here and there and you are not thinking of this essential, important thing which is the preaching of Christ crucified, the one who died on the cross. You are perpetually consecrated to the doctrine of the cross. And you are preaching. Be a preacher. Be a soul winner. Be an investor. The harvest is plenteous, but the laborers are few. And the Lord is calling you that you will give the preaching of the provision of the cross of Calvary. You will give that the priority. Let not a day pass without you preaching that word, bringing the word to somebody, telling them religion is not enough. We must be reconciled to Christ through the cross of Calvary and through what Christ has done and purchased for us. And then um, you warn uh, the sinners of their damnation uh, if they reject the gospel, if they abandon the gospel, if they don't receive uh, the gospel, if they don't believe the gospel, there is danger. Christ said, go ye to all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not, he that contradicts, he that argues, he that seems to be wiser than the gospel, 
wiser than God, wiser than the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. Such a person, he that believeth not shall be damned. And as you go preach faithfully, preach confidently, preach persuasively, preach powerfully, develop yourself that you'll preach the gospel without looking back and without being sidetracked that you concentrate on the preaching of the gospel you'll be a partaker of the power of christ and then you make the other people partakers of the power of christ there's converting power big those here are uh, partakers of converting power and there is the power, we have sanctifying power, make those people who are saved, you are preaching to, make them partakers of the sanctifying power of the cross of Christ, of the gospel of the Lord, Christ crucified. And there is overcoming power, the concourse power, it shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the uttermost part of the earth. The people who listen to you, as well as yourself, have the conquering power, the, concor the concourse power, the power of the Holy Ghost. Be a partaker and help other people too to be a partaker. And remember, as we bring the prayer to a conclusion, that the Lord wants us to have unity. Perfect unity. Permanent unity. Progressive unity. Pointed, persuasive unity. Practical unity. Visible. That everybody can tell, everybody can see that we, you and I, are united on one thing, we're united on the gospel, and we're united on the calling that the Lord himself has given us. And tell the Lord what God does ought to be permanent, that what he has done in your heart, in my heart, in our hearts today, as leaders, as ministers, messengers of the Lord, ministers of the gospel, of the mystery of Christ, what has done in our hearts must be permanent. It can be every day we we'll go back to the cross, every day we we'll have the mind of Christ, every day we we'll possess the mind of Christ, and the unity will be permanent and perfect. Father, we bless your name for what we have learned today. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the truth. Thank you for your calling in our lives. Lord, we pray that this calling will fulfill in Jesus' name. Help us to be perfectly united together. Help us to be purposefully united together. Help us to be united together in the preaching of the gospel, the same gospel, the same word, the same doctrine. And Lord, we pray there will be no division, no contention, no debate, no strife in our midst in Jesus' name. We pray, Lord, that this practical unity, perpetual unity, perfect unity will make us more powerful in proclaiming your word as you have prayed for us that the world will see how united we are and they will believe that the Lord, the Father, has sent you. And as they believe that the Father has sent you to be a propitiation for our sin and to be a savior, many will turn to the Lord and be saved. Many will turn to the Lord, be truly converted and transformed many will turn to the lord and abide and remain in the lord in jesus name we we'll pray lord as we preach you will manifest yourself in the lives in the hearts of the people they'll be saving power they'll become new creatures transformed by the power of the gospel in jesus name as we preach and proclaim your mind there'll be sanctifying power that lord you purify the hearts of the people as you have purified our hearts in jesus name and lord we pray there'll be spiritual power dynamite in every life who have been saved and sanctified there'll be dynamite the dynamo of the spirit will be 
in their lives chill. You grant them courage and fearlessness to live uncompromising lives and to preach to compromisingly in Jesus' name. We pray, Lord, the unity will be perpetual, will be permanent, will be perfect until we see you face to face be one with the Father, one with the Son, one with the Holy Ghost, one with the Scriptures, and one with the saints of God, one with the church of the living God in Jesus' name. We thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you and God bless you. May the work of God, the work of grace in your life, in our lives all together, be permanent in Jesus' name.